All right, starting again basically where we left off. We're talking about the things that impact uh, the meaning of the artwork or that help us identify the style of the artwork. So here's our mind map. We've talked about subject, we've talked about physical properties, we've talked about visual structure that includes formal elements and composition. Now I want to add in um, another one. So uh, just reminder of composition here. We, we finished off with that one on the last one. You're going to have lots of opportunities to practice. So the last one that I want to add in is cultural context. And um, I've tossed all the bits in here, but I want to, I want to start by just focusing right here. Cultural context means, and, and here we're actually talking about the integration of these artworks into their cultural context. So culture impacts what we think an artwork should look like. In the, in the first chapter, in the introduction chapter, you read about Te Pehikupe, um, the Maori chief, and uh, John Henry Sylvester, who both painted a portrait of Te Pehikupe. But they were both very much influenced by what their culture said artwork should be. So it's easy, when you start to talk about cultural context, it's easy to talk about just who made it. When was it made? Who paid for it? Or who was it made for? And uh, where it was made. So uh, was it made in Italy or in uh, Yakima? Uh, was it um, made to be in a church? Or was it made to be in somebody's house, right? So these things you can find pretty easily, fairly easily for most things. The two at the bottom are a little bit more complex, though. How do the cultural values of an artwork impact what the artwork's going to look like? Who, and, and of course, cultural values might be one culture thinks it's really important to show the, the, how a person looks in space with the incidental effects of light. You know, if there's a light shining on their face and there's a shadow on the other side of their face. Um, maybe this culture thinks it's really important to show the clothing that they're wearing or the, exactly the way their hair looks. Another culture with different values might think that the most important thing to show is that they, uh, you know, who they are in the, in the society. So maybe it shows a symbol that tells us who they are. Or maybe it shows um, something about where they live, right? Interestingly, if you ask little kids to, to paint a painting, you know, tell, show us a picture of your family, they might show the size of people really weird Right, uh, the, all the kids might be as tall as the parents, but they'll include clues as to who the people are. Or another thing that often happens is when little kids are learning to draw is they show the heads really, really big. Now that's not realistic, and so a culture that values uh, making a painting that looks exactly like real life will say you've done that incorrectly. But we can learn a lot about the person if we can see their face larger. Right? So cultural values are hard to figure out. They're really subtle sometimes. You can't, if you are influenced by your culture, it's hard to see that because you think, well, this is normal. This is what I've grown up with. Um, the other one that's maybe a little easier to get at is how the work is used um, or how it was used or how it was intended to be used. Uh, in the Renaissance period or the medieval period, we look at a lot of altar pieces that were meant to be used in the church, and they had a particular you know, goal. They were meant to be looked at, uh, people worshiping. It was a focus of their worship, that it was part of the, the religion and it was part of the church service. All right, so let's look at a picture and talk about some of these things. There's lots of questions we can be asking, like I said, and then some of the, the pieces are a little bit more subtle. This painting is, uh, we can talk about the materials and the size and the subject and where things are, but if we're going to talk about the cultural influence, we probably need to know some of the iconography or some of the symbolism. We probably need to know when this artwork was made, and we also need to, uh, or, or it's helpful for us to learn or understand whether this was a picture of exactly what was happening that day or not, right? All right, so let's start with some of these. This was made in 1830. If we know a little bit about what's happening in 1830, that might help us to understand um, some more things about it. I'll get back to that in a moment. Eugène Delacroix um, painted this. He was a French painter. Now, sometimes where the painting is now in the Musée du Louvre in Paris um, doesn't tell us 
where the artwork was originally made, but in this case, I know, and I'm telling you, this is a French painting. So in France in 1830, anybody know what was going on? There was this French Revolution thing happening. Uh, this is the French flag. All of those pieces together help us understand that this is a painting that is related to the French Revolution in some way. We can learn more about it to learn how it was related. Now, who was this, who, who made it, and who, who is this guy? Who's Eugene, Eugene Delacroix? Why did he make this? Who did he make it for? How was this painting seen or used at the time? Now, this was not an altarpiece. It wasn't part of a religion. This was a painting made with some social commentary in mind or to, to talk about politics and, and what's happening in France at the time. This is also a fairly large painting, eight feet, eight and a half feet by ten, more than ten and a half feet. Um, this is a really big painting. And it was uh, made basically to encourage people to, uh, you know, support the side of the, the revolution. Now, the title is another clue here, Liberty Leading the People. Now, this woman here is not really a woman who was walking around that day. I always uh, joke about this painting. If you're going to lead a revolution, you might want to put a shirt on and maybe some shoes. But she is in this picture to uh, motivate the the French people in their revolution. She is the personification of liberty and she's holding the French flag and she's a beautiful woman and I guess she has her breasts hanging out and all of this is is meant to be inspiring. The people who are around her are dressed in clothing that is meant, if you know the, the iconography or you know the culture at the time, it's meant to tell us that um, they are different people who are involved in the revolution, so different kinds of French people, essentially. This is not necessarily a realistic depiction of what the French Revolution was like, but understanding why it was made, when it was made, where it was made, and what was going on at that time helps us understand a lot more about what was the point of the painting and why it was made. We also can understand the style of this artwork, that this was a romantic painting, not in the sense of like kissing and hugging and love and butter and, uh, you know, hearts and things like that, but in the sense of the drama of this moment, that the artist has painted not just what he sees, but a story that he's trying to tell us to give us a, a sense of the, the drama and the energy and the passion of this movement. So, as a review here, our art history methods, we are talking about, phys in this class, we are going to talk every week about physical properties, visual structure, subject iconography and symbolism, <coughs> and integration into cultural context. We are also going to talk about style, and like I've said, all of these kind of influence style. Because style is often visual structure, but it can also be the subject, how the subject, you know, what subjects are depicted. For example, in Romanticism, you might have subjects depicted in a very dramatic way, but you might also have the subjects that are chosen are already dramatic kinds of subjects. Um, the physical properties is one that you should pretty much understand in the first couple of weeks. And I say pretty much because, like I said, people tend to overlook it. They forget about it. Visual structure is one that we're going to practice, and it's going to take you some time to, to totally understand how to talk about it. But what I do want you to understand in the first several weeks is when we're talking about visual structure. Where things are in the painting, let's go back to our mind map. Where thing, what the things are, lights, color, shot, texture, pattern, uh, line, depth, tone, color. Um, and where things are, composition, how they are arranged. Are they over here or over there? Are they uh, giving us a sense of balance or, or rhythm or emphasis, right? Um, in fact, I would recommend that maybe you draw your own mind map here that's talking, that helps you identify and kind of space out these various things. We will eventually in class, I'm going to have you guys draw a mind map for a particular artwork that's trying to space out some of these things. Um, subject is going to be fairly straightforward, but iconography, symbolism, conventions, those are going to take a little bit more work to, to get a total handle on. 
Um, and then the last one here, integration into cultural context. The first part of that should be fairly straightforward. What, how old is it? But the next parts uh, that get into how does the culture impact what's going on, those are going to take some practice. And we're going to get lots of chances to practice. And, uh, and going into the rest of this week, you've got some discussion forum stuff that I want you to do for the Unit 1 discussion forum uh, about the introduction in this video. In that discussion forum, I want you to participate. I want you to get involved. I want you to practice using some of these terms and applying some of these terms. And I want you to also have a chance to revise. So you're going to practice using these terms. Pick an artwork and just tell us what the physical properties are. Or pick an artwork and just tell us what the composition is. Or if that's challenging, tell us some things about the composition. And then you can ask some questions as well. Look at what your classmates have posted. Discuss their work with them. If somebody described the physical properties of an artwork, maybe you can come in and reply by describing the subject. Suggest changes. I'm going to ask some questions. You can ask questions too, and we can all work together to answer them. Our goal here is to try to tighten up, uh, make, make better our explanations. And the best way you're going to be able to do that is by practicing. Like I said, I'm going to ask you some questions in that discussion forum, and I'm going to make some revisions, and I'm not doing that to pick on you. I'm doing that to help you become better at explaining what you know, or to help you understand something more clearly. So the discussion forum is a great place to make mistakes and uh, make improvements and discuss things and ask questions. It doesn't have to, discussion forum does not have to be perfect the first time around. All right, email me, let me know if you have questions, um, keep talking with me, and go ahead and get started on stuff. Thanks.